Good morning, everyone. We would like to introduce the speaker of the session, Dr. Mohan, who is the advisor, biotech product development and stewardship, a microbiologist by education, training and experience. His contributions spanning the entire scientific career of 40 years have been in the development and insect control technologies for plantation crops, horticulture crops, cotton, corn and biofertilizers. He has earned his BSc and MSc in microbiology from Punjab University, Chandigarh, followed by a doctorate degree in virology in 1991 from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Dr. Mohan is currently the research advisor for a leading BT cotton seed producing company for developing insect control technologies using microbes and their products. He retired from Monsanto, India in 2016 in the roles of lead product development and stewardship, having led the efforts in India for BT cotton and BT maize, including insect resistance management since 1998. In this role, he has coordinated teams in the discovery pipeline, technology development, regulatory science and affairs, and scientific outreach. He has completed many IRM-related collaborative studies with ICAR institutions and agricultural universities during his tenure. Prior to his stint in Monsanto, he was a research scientist in the Agricultural Research Service of ICAR in various positions from scientist to senior scientist at Central Plantation Crops Research Institute and Indian Institute of Horticultural Research, Bangalore. And he developed microbial insecticides for the management of pests of plantation and horticulture crops. He has more than 60 research publications and four US patents in BT technology. Sir, on behalf of the college management, principal, staff, and students of biotech department, we cordially welcome you to the session, sir. It's over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Ajita. Thank you very much. I will. Uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Manjunath uh, and and Dr. Ajita who have been in touch with me, and uh, I'm very thankful for the invitation uh, for, for this talk. And I would also like to thank Dr. Krishna Kumar who was instrumental in uh, putting me in touch with the Oxford uh, University. Or, or Oxford Engineering College. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, how much time do I have? Sir, uh, one hour of presentation or one, one hour, 15 minutes of OK, I think that's plenty, and so we can have a very leisurely discussion. Uh, let me see how it goes. OK, uh, good afternoon again, and uh, I thought of uh, you know speaking on the uh, you know microorganisms associated with plants i mean this has been known for the last uh, let's say 100 years since the days of uh, vinogradsky bejerenkai and those people i mean who were the pioneers in in soil microbiology and they were the first ones to study the association of microorganisms uh, and 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 could very clearly see that these were beneficial for the growth of the plant. And uh, so, uh, so I thought maybe I should talk about uh, the microorganisms associated with plants, with the root systems, with the shoot system, and then probably look into the cases where these microorganisms have been converted into products for agriculture and this is where i try to focus on a few uh, you know established and successful studies uh, carried out by a few companies in the united states where they are been very successful in converting these microorganisms into products and now let's get into a few uh, definitions for example you know Microbiome is, is a very loosely used you know, terminology these days. Uh, in fact, uh, microbiome, as it says, refers to the collection of genomes. Uh, one minute, I am having some problem in, uh, yeah, I'm fine. It refers to the collection of genomes of all the microorganisms in the environment and ecological niche. Uh, just testing. Am I am I audible clearly? 
say yes, sir. Okay, great, great. Now microbiota. I mean, see the the terms microbiome and microbiota are sometimes interchangeably used, and it's not a big crime because there's only a small and subtle difference between the two. As I said, microbiome refers to the collection of genomes of all those or organisms which are found in a particular ecological niche. Whereas microbiota refers to the microorganisms again, which occupy the ecological niche, but more from an application perspective. For example, in, in, in a particular ecological niche, if the species of bacteria and fungi are known, and if they are on a state of, uh, you know, takeoff to a product, then we call it as a microbiota. Whereas if we are not sure of the species composing of the ecological niche, then what we generally do is we take a sample of that ecological niche, extract the entire DNA, and then we analyze the genomes. In such a case, we call it a microbiome. That is a collection of the genomes which of uh, belonging to you know, those species of microorganisms occupying that ecological niche. And another term is consortium. A consortium refers to a closely knit community of functionally interdependent microorganisms which occupy an ecological niche. I mean, uh, the consortium refers to only those which are interdependent and which have come together through evolution for a common purpose. And uh, the last one is metagenomic approaches. Uh, for example, as I said, soil microbiology you know, began around 100 years ago. And in those times, whatever species, bacterial or fungal species, they could culture and study, uh, they believed they formed the they formed the microbiome or the microbiota of that particular ecological niche, which is no longer true because a vast majority of the species are non-culturable, which means they don't show up on the petri plate, but they are still there medical approach where we extract the DNA or the genome of the entire ecological niche and then using uh, bioinformatics studies we've tried to ascertain the number of species microbial species which occupy that niche uh, so with these uh, definitions we get into the body of the talk and now, see, agriculture is becoming more challenging to all the farmers throughout the globe. Why is it so? Because the resources are very limiting. First of all, water is a source. I mean, water resource is very, very limiting. And uh, for example, it is estimated that there's going to be a 40% gap between the demand for crops and what will be easily available. Number two, land is shrinking because they believe that intensive agriculture has resulted, resulted in degradation of the land. So 20% of the arable land is estimated to be you know, lost due to degradation. So with shrinking water resource, with shrinking land, and the third one which is hanging above our heads is the climate change. And we are already seeing the signs of that climate change, extreme weathers, extreme typhoons, hurricanes, drought, recurrent drought in certain parts of the globe. So these are the you know, signs of a climate change which is going to happen in the next 50 years. And then it is estimated that the agriculture productivity is going to suffer ranging from 3 to 16 percent by 2080. As a result of this, you know, the productivity gain. See, for example, agriculture has gained in the last 50 years due to advancements in breeding science, due to advancements in plant protection. But then all these gains are being lost because of degradation of land, because of, uh, you know, limiting water resource and the climate change. 
So, so, so agriculture is going to be very, very demanding and very, very challenging to all the farmers, especially those farmers in the developing world. And that is where, uh, you know, a majority of the population lives. OK, now coming to the microbiomes, it is being increasingly felt that microbiomes will be the future focus of human medicine and agriculture. And this is not without reason. Because um, in the last 10 years, I would say, because of the advancements in molecular biology, metagenomics, and uh, the uh, analyzing tools of bioinformatics, we have been able to understand life much more, more intrinsically. And as a result, it, it, the, the Royal Society, you know, organized a meeting on the li on the left hand side. Uh, they organized a meeting in 2018, focusing on the microbiomes throughout the world and its potential in human medicine and agriculture. And now uh, it is being increasingly felt that harnessing microbiomes will be among the breakthroughs in science and technology which is going to transform our future. See, for example, uh, life sciences as, as a whole undergoes a quantum leap every 30 to 40 years because of technological advancements. So the next quantum leap in life sciences, which would read, which would lead to certain products in human medicine uh, and, and agriculture is going to be under deeper understanding of the microbiomes and turning many of them into products. And we will be focusing specifically on agriculture. Now, I would like to probably read out the two quotes, I mean, which are very, very relevant. Uh, I would be reading out the, uh, the latter quote in black letters. It says, all animals and plants are the sum of not only the products of their own genomes, but also of the genomes of the microorganisms that inhabited and have co-evolved with them from the start of evolution. I mean, how many of us realize that we carry an equal number of cells of my microbes on us? And the next slide will tell us that. OK, this is a slide which kind of highlights the importance and the and the uh, role uh, the microorganisms play in, in the human body. I mean, do you realize, uh, suppose you have n number of cells, uh, the microbes which uh, occupy your skin, which occupy within the gut, within the various organs, they are more in number of cells than this than, than the human body. So, so, so the and, and then subsequently or consequently, the genes derived from the microbiome is about 300 times more in diversity and number as compared to the genome of the human. For example, if you go to the uh, right bottom corner, it's not uh, very visible. It says that human genome has about uh, about 200 to you know 2,000 to 2,500 genes. I mean the genes whose functions have been assigned. Whereas if you look at the genes of the microbiome which is on us, it's about 3.3 million, about 360 folds. For every gene in the, in on the human body, there are 360 genes of the. Uh, of the microbiome. Now, uh, I would like to focus on a very elegant and simple experiment which was published in ecological uh, monographs, okay, in the year 1985. So what this group had done was they grew plants in sterile soil, then they added in another set of pots, they added uh, you know, the bacterial uh, load which comes with the soil to this plant. And then they added the bacterial and then nematode population which feeds on the bacteria. Then in another set of pots, they added the fungal population, the fungal microbiome. And then in another set of pots, they added, they, they planted the seedlings in a complete soil with all the microbiome. And look, what, what it shows is 
the plant, the root, the shoot weight was about four, 14 milligrams in those spots which had the entire microbiome, the, the bacterial cells, the nematodes, the fungi, and so on. Whereas the plants which grow in sterile soil, the shoot weight was just about two milligrams. I mean, this tells us a lot about the role played by the plant-associated microbes in, uh, in, in the growth and yield of the plants. Now, the microbiomes or the microbial consortia, which occupy all the ecological niches on this earth, did they come by chance? Maybe when the eukaryotic uh, you know, cells were evolving around uh, maybe 3.5 million ago, years ago, uh, you know, they came by chance. But then over these millions of years ago, they have been evolving and in, into very tightly knit consortia. For example, the composition of the micro, microbiome uh, has evolved uh, to be the one with a common purpose in the hydrothermal vents under the sea, in the deep sea, in the, in, in the backwaters, in the estuaries, in the deep mines, in the human gut, and the plant-associated uh, microbiomes. So, so over these millions of years, they have co-evolved with the host in such a way that there is a lot of give and take between the major organism and the microbiomes. It is not by chance that these, micro, the, these microbial species forming a microbiome have come together. It is through evolution, millions of years of evolution, they have evolved with the host. And, and, and this slide, I just, I mean, it's very crowded. I don't want you to go through the entire thing. So I just want to leave the message with you that the mutualism is very, very ancient. For example, we all know that the, the organelles like mitochondria and chloroplasts have prokaryotic origin, and they have gone into the eukaryotic cells, and they serve very important functions today. So mutualism among microbes took, took advantage of the ecological niches by forming consortia. And these are deep and intense relationship between the host and the microbiome, and they cannot be separated. If they are separated, the host will die, and the plants will die, the human beings will die. And for example, if you look at the fossil records, you know, endophytic fungi have been recorded in all the fossils of plants and animals which evolved, uh, you know, over millions of years ago. Okay, why microbiome research has gained a lot of importance? Uh, I'm just doing a process check. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Hello. Yes, okay, sir. Uh, and the slides can be seen clearly? Yes, sir. Great, thank you. Now, why microbiome research has gained a lot of importance and, and, and the number of papers being published is really exponentially increasing. This is because we have started increasingly you know, aware that every environmental niche on Earth is occupied by a consortium of microbial species. Every possible niche. The composition of microbiota is stable and has evolved over millions of years. And it is increasing realization that the naturally evolved microbiome is important for the health of the organism. You remove the microbiome, you, if, if the organism is brought up in you know, sterile soil or it under axonic culture, axonic conditions, the animal or the plant will die. Such is the intense cooperation between the microbiota and the uh, major organism. Uh, as I initially said, see our earlier understanding of the microbiome diversity in the plant soil, I mean, in, in, on the human beings, on, on the animals, farm animals, it was uh, limited to whatever could be cultured on the nutrient medium. Okay, whatever could be cultured. 
But now, with the recent advances in molecular biology, in sequencing, high fidelity sequencing, and more economical sequencing, DNA sequencing, and the bioinformatic tools which are available with us, we have been able to understand life much, much more deeply in the last, let's say, 20 years. And this is known as the metagenomic approach to microbiome uh, speciation. Now, if you look at the you know, agriculture, the crop yield. Now, the crop yield is a function of many biotic and abiotic factors. Now, this can be, this can range from the crop genotype. So we try to get the best of the genes from the parents and the plant breeders have been doing an excellent job in the last 50 years. And uh, the crop phenotype, which really shows us the yield, the environment, the management, that is farm management, the kind of uh, you know, fertilizer inputs, pesticide sprays and so on. All these, you know, go they go to determine the yield. And then we have the uh, the areas where we are interested, which are the ambient microbial community occupying the leaves, occupying the areas around the root. Now these uh, ambient are generalists. For example, they are involved in the carbon cycle. They are involved in the nitrogen cycle. The generalists. And then we have the crop specific microbiome, which are specific by the crop. For example, the microbiome uh, around the roots of a soya bean plant may not be the same as a wheat plant, may not be the same as a cotton plant. So every crop has a crop specific microbiome, and that is being studied very, very intensively in the last few years. So I mean, technologically speaking, on one hand, you have the, you have crop breeding, you have plant protection, which can increase the yield. Now, what we are increasingly understanding is we also need to provide the plant with the the correct correct microbiome, plant specific microbiome, and the generalists, which which uh, uh, turn all these uh, resources into yield. Now, if you look at that, uh, the plant-microbe interactions are very, very complex, very complex, and but they are key to the plant health. For example, there are a lot of microbes, fungi, bacteria, which occupy niches in the foliage, in the flowers, that is above the ground. And these, these are known as the epiphytic microbiome, microbes or philoflane microbes. And then below the soil is where all the activity takes place. And this is where you have majority of the action taking place. And see, uh, the plant also responds. The plant, believe me, produces 10% of the photosynthetically fixed carbon. And 10 to 16% of plant nitrogen are exuded out of the roots, exuded out of the leaves, to try to kind of incentivize uh, these microbiomes, these microbiota. Now, the microbial species associated with the plant, they feed on these exudates. I mean, there are sugar exudate, there are amino acids, they are vitamins produced by the plant. So all these exudates, they encourage the microbial species to colonize the root area, colonize the leaf area, and thereby provide health to the plants. For example, in the root area, you have the plant growth promoting rhizobacteria and fungi, you have the mycorrhiza, you have the nitrogen fixing bacteria. Again, you have two types, the free nitrogen fixing bacteria and the ones which are symbiotically associated with, uh, you know, for example, the legume leguminous crops. And then uh, in, in the root region, you also have the root pathogens, you know, trying to get entry into the plant. And then there are microbes which are antagonistic to these root pathogens. Okay. And many of these microbes, they produce, um, you know, certain chemicals which are antagonistic to the root pathogens and they also produce certain organic molecules known as siderophores which will starve the root pathogens uh, in many ways as we will see in the next slide. 
So again, there's a lot of give and take between the host plant and the microbes associated with the plant. As I said, the plant also produce, I mean, provides a lot of encouragement through the root exudates containing sugars, simple sugars containing vitamins, amino acids, and certain compounds, certain signals, signaling molecules, you know, which will encourage these uh, microbiomes to multiply and colonize the area around the root, the area on the leaves. So it's extremely complex. Okay, how do we exploit? Okay, I mean, to increase productivity or to sustain plant productivity, we can exploit many of these beneficial microbes. And this, uh, this, this, this has had been happening for the last uh, 50 years, I would say, and more so in the last 20 years since organic uh, uh, you know, agriculture has picked up. For example, biopesticides, uh, you know, we, we are uh, aware of the very popular Bacillus thuringiensis whose products have been cloned into plants and we have Bt maize, Bt soybean, Bt cotton and so on. In India, we have Bt cotton. And uh, root nodulating bacteria which can fix nitrogen symbiotically uh, in, in the leguminous plants. And we have the WAM, that is arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, which infect the roots and thereby they, they scavenge for uh, you know, nutrients from the soil, as well as they increase the root size and mass so that it also protects the plant from drought. For example, they can go deeper, they can grow wider and pick up the, uh, you know, the, the moisture for the plant. And then we have the leaf, uh, the, the leaf and shoot colonizers, you know, a lot of bacillus species, Ervinia, Pseudomonas, they reside in niches on the leaf and the, on the flowers. And uh, we have the root colonizers, uh, which are antagonistic to you know, the root uh, disease causing uh, microorganisms in the soil. We have the biocontrol fungi and bacteria, and all of them can be, can be harnessed as products. And this is where the next part of the talk will be taking us. Now, as I said, if you sow a seed, a plant will develop and naturally it will attract uh, the, you know, the uh, microorganisms which will colonize the roots and the leaves. But this is a slow process. Can we, can we speed up this process? and get better yield. Yes, certainly this is possible. So plant microbe interaction can be manipulated, can be enhanced. For example, if you were to provide a ready-made colony of microorganisms uh, to the seedling, well, the seedling will quickly establish and uh, give you better yield. And this is the, 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 the uh, underlying uh, under, uh, basis. So if we are to inoculate key microbiome members through seed dressing, seed coating, that is if these microbes are coated onto the seed, or, or if they can be provided as a slurry by the side of the developing seedling, then it will, uh, it will provide the right conditions for the plant to establish these plant-associated microbes very quickly, very quickly and thereby also try to you know, delay or avoid the disease-causing microorganisms coming close to the, the roots. Now, microbiota improvement can be achieved by appropriate agronomic practices. For example, if you, uh, if you plow the land, if you give organic fertilizers, uh, you know, compost material, if you increase the organic car carbon in the soil, this will help the microbiota establishment. For example, even plant breeding. If you can breed plants which can respond much better to the signals, to the chemicals, to the resources uh, being given by the microbiota, then it will lead to better yield. And, you know, there are also efforts to introduce microbiomes from the wild species of the crop. For example, if we can go to the Andes Mountains and pick up the microbiota 
uh, around uh, the root region of wild potato and bring it and see if it uh, does better uh, in the cultivated potato. So these are little, uh, you know, uh, bright spots which have been occurring in the in the area of uh, increasing yield. And lastly, off late, there has been a lot of uh, emphasis on no-till farming. For example, if a farmer is growing maize and if he harvests the maize, but then if he lets the stubble and the root system as such, and if he has to sow the next crop of maize, what he does is he makes a hole few centimeters away from the old plant. He drops the seed. And as the seed develops, the microbiome occupying the root region of the old plant will now slowly migrate and, uh, you know, they will start colonizing the root region of the developing seedling. So the seedling gets a sudden boost of colonizers coming from the root region of the old maize plant. So this is no-till farming where the, the land is not tilled, it is not plowed extensively, but the old crop is harvested and the root is, is allowed to remain in the soil. And uh, holes are drilled a few centimeters away from the old root and the seeds are dropped. This is no tills. Uh, and agronomically speaking, this makes a lot of sense because the entire microbiome, the plant associated microbiome, they migrate from the old decaying roots to the new developing roots of the maize plant. And this is catching up. So, I mean, what I'm trying to say is uh, deep plowing, deep furrowing of the plant, uh, of the land is no longer necessary if you are planning to raise the same crop again in the next season. This preserves the microbiome. And then, uh, you know, the, the microbial species have been taken advantage of. They have been developed into products. For example, trichoderma harzianum and bacillus species are widely used in agriculture in India. And a number of companies, uh, startup companies, many of them, are providing uh, these two uh, organisms to the farmers so that they can practice organic uh, uh, agriculture or green agriculture. Now, this fungus, uh, trichoderma and both bacillus subtilis, they colonize the root region of the growing plant and they deter or, or, or they produce antagonistic molecules which deter the development of uh, disease-causing microorganisms, I mean, especially those which infect through the roots. See, another organism which is widely used in agriculture is vesicular arbuscular mycorrhiza, or VAM, I mean, as I call it. This is a wonder biological uh, organism. Uh, this uh, infects the roots of the uh, host plant and there and, and also does the job of scavenging for you know nitrogen and other elements from far away. It increases the root area. It increases the root mass. As a result, it can withstand the, the plants can withstand drought much better because they can scavenge for moisture deep with from the layers, from the deeper layers of the earth. And they can also scavenge for the, I mean, if, if for example, certain elements like iron, like copper, like, uh, you know, uh, other micronutrients, very, very efficiently it can scavenge and supply it to the plants. Now, now these, these microorganisms which have been established to provide benefit to the growing plant, they are being now increasingly used as seed dressings. For example, the rhizobium, uh, you know, the symbiotically, uh, the, the ones which fix nitrogen symbiotically or the free nitrogen fixers uh, can be coated onto the seeds. And this seed dressing microbial is a growing industry globally. For example, if you look at the the top, uh, the, the bottom right hand corner, the picture shows the difference between seedlings which have been inoculated with VAM, 
that vesicular or vascular mycorrhiza, fungi, and the ones on the left hand side have not been. Look at the difference in growth. And this, see, early establishment of seedling goes a long way in increasing yield of the plant finally. As I also said, many of these uh, beneficial microorganisms produce siderophores. Siderophores are organic molecules which bind to the ferric ion in the soil. And they, they as a result, they starve the disease-causing microorganisms uh, from establishing, from colonizing the area and causing disease. And uh, when these, uh, you know, beneficial microorganisms which accumulate iron within their cells using siderophores, when they decay, that iron is being available to the plants. And many of the siderophore producing microorganisms belong to Azetobacter, Pseudomonas, Bacillus, and the Streptomyces species. And finally, endophytes. See, in the last, uh, let's say, 30 years, we believed that the microbiota which are beneficial to the plants live externally, excepting probably the rhizobium, which we knew that they cause nodules and they live within the root region. But we also, in the last 20, 25 years, we have started realizing that there are a lot of endophytes within the vascular bundles, within the plant, uh, which was not un, which was not known in the last 15 years. So now increasingly, you know, research is being carried out to see and catalog those microbial species which occupy uh, as endophytes. You know, endophytes can be deep within the plant, within their vascular bundles. It can be in the root region. It can be in, near the, uh, you know, the leaves and so on. And many of them, many of these endophytes are also, you know, they produce potent anti-cancer drugs from plant endophytes. So this is a spin-off benefit. I mean, not only are the endophytes involved in protecting the plant, produce uh, and uh, supplying it with uh, the nutrients, but they are also involved in, and, and this is a, the spin-off benefit is these, when they are cultured, uh, they have been discovered to produce many anti-cancer drugs. So many of these endophytes are now being investigated for, uh, you know, anti-cancer drugs. And now this uh, this slide probably shows you the various uh, beneficial microorganisms which have been developed as biofertilizers, uh, based on their function and nature. For example, you have the nitrogen-fixing biofertilizers. I won't be reading out the names. I am sure this is common knowledge. We have the symbiotic, associated symbiotic uh, nitrogen fixers, the phosphate solubilizing biofertilizers, the, you know, then the phosphate moisture mobilizing biofertilizers, biofertilizers which uh, mobilize micronutrients like silicates and zinc and, you know, copper and ferric, and those which protect, which are antagonistic to the disease causing microorganisms. All these organisms have been have the had the potential uh, to be developed as uh, you know as as products and and so in the last uh, I would say thirty years a lot of these products have come out in the market and they have a huge market potential. Uh, yeah, so these are the various types of my biofertilizers which have been harnessed uh, and used for increasing productivity in plants. Uh, I will not dwell into the because I have already spoken about it in the last slide. OK, now coming to the business part of it. See, global biofertilizer market is very, very large and growing exponentially. I mean, for example, this slide shows that the value estimated value in 2019 was two billion, two billion US dollars. Uh, since these slides were from information from the uh, US. And the 2025 estimate is 3.8, almost double of what it was in 2019. So the global biofertilizer market is growing. And uh, I have uh, given on the right hand side a, 
a number of key companies which are involved in the production of biofertilizers. And uh, the ones in red font are the ones present in India. Believe me, there is a very strong biofertilizer production and market in India. Stains Company, Phytopharma India, International Panacea Limited, Can Biosis, Madras Fertilizers, Gujarat State Fertilizers and Chemicals, Rashtriya Chemicals and Fertilizers, some, some of the uh, giants in India which have been producing biofertilizers for the last 20, 30 years. So there is a big, big market. So, uh, so if if I mean, but these biofertilizers are based on the established beneficial microorganisms. Now it is for these startup companies, those innovators, who if they can catalog, if they can find new microorganisms and produce them as products. I mean, this is a huge potential and area for these startup companies. Now the market potential of biofertilizers is around 14% on the on the top left hand side corner. You can see the figure 14%. The cumulative average growth, uh, the, the, the cumulative annual growth rate, CAGR is about 14%. That is the, the average across many years in the last 10 years. On the right hand top corner, you see a figure of 12.81, which means the year on year growth of biofertilizers globally is about 12.81. Now, uh, the growth of biofertilizers has got a real fillip. It has got a real boost because of the tendency for organic, organic agriculture globally. And India produces a lot of organic agriculture. But unfortunately, the production of these biofertilizers is limited to a small group of companies, well-established small group of companies. I mean, this is where there is still space for startups, you know. And and uh, in the next few slides, I will be showing the uh, I will be giving you the case studies of a few startups in the United States, which have right from the discovery pipeline have come a long way in producing products uh, for agriculture. Now, the rising trend of organic farming is actually driving the demand for biofertilizers globally. Now, this is the global scenario. For example, uh, in 2014, uh, you know, the area under organic farming in million hectares was 43.7. In 2017, it is 64.2 and 2021, I don't have the figures. I mean, I don't uh, show the figures. It is 81.2 million hectares. So it is exponentially rising because uh, and the biofertilizer market is trying to match up the demands for organically produced, uh, uh, you know, agri products. India too is a big consumer of uh, you know organ of of biofertilizers, and uh, so I mean the drivers being steadily increasing demand for eco-friendly food, organic food, organic agriculture, and it has also been realized that biological agriculture or the green agriculture using biofertilizers is much more economical than using you know, insecticides, fungicides, uh, herbicides for farming. And, uh, you know, biofertilizers also add a lot of value to the expensive seed with traits. I'm particularly referring to the genetically modified seeds, GM crops. So if this GM crops can be supplement supplemented with biofertilizers, uh, it adds a lot of value and saves a lot of cost to the farmer. And, you know, biofertilizers, they form a very good fit into the natural farming. Uh, I think the whole entire, the entire globe is leaning towards green agriculture or natural farming. Okay, what about India? I mean, this slide tells the innovators and the startup companies there is a big demand for biofertilizers in India. Okay, if you look at the crops, 
which are organically produced. The top of the list is tea. And, and tea is a major organic, organically produced uh, product which is being exported. So a lot of these export oriented uh, agriculture products use biofertilizers because the label organically grown has a niche market. It, it, it fetches a higher price in the market. OK, especially the uh, European Union is very stringent on the level of uh, insecticides, on the residues of insecticides, herbicides in the produce. As a result, biofertilizers, you know, they are very favorable towards, uh, you know, good market in the European Union and the United States. So look at the look at the number of uh, uh, agriculture products in India, which are which which command organically driven, uh, you know, biofertilizers, tea, rice, fruits and vegetables, cotton, wheat, and the last is probably oil seeds because if a lot of oil is being ex organically extracted, I mean, uh, in, in, in the industries, so probably that attracts uh, a low volume of biofertilizers. So, I mean, the, the product which attracts a high volume of biofertilizer is tea and coffee. So what I'm trying to drive is there is simply a lot of space in India for biofertilizers. So people thinking on the lines of uh, a startup company for biofertilizers, yes, you still have space in the market. Now, how can these beneficial microorganisms be delivered to the plant? See, one way is uh, as the plant is growing, you dig a furrow, you pour the uh, beneficial microorganisms as a slurry. That is one. But the farmer does not want to do anything more than so and you know and and protect the plant. So now there is an increasing focus on seed coating and pelleting. Can these microorganisms be coated onto the seeds while while in, in, while manufacturing? And a coated seed can it be provided to the farmer so that the farmer will sow? The microorganisms which are in the coat will slowly disintegrate. They will colonize the growing root of the plant. So the seedling gets a fill up, immediate uh, uh, you know, uh, dose of uh, symbionts or the uh, free nitrogen fixers are already available uh, near the growing root. So uh, this, this, this industry is actually growing in India, seed treatment. But what are the gaps? I mean, these are the gaps uh, which are, uh, you know, good subjects for investigation uh, by the startups. For example, these microbes, how viable will they be if they are coated onto the seeds? The shelf life is not very long. For example, if it is fungi, if it is uh, the vesicular or vascular mycorrhiza, if it is the other beneficial fungi you are trying to coat onto the seed, the, sh the shelf life is not much because they tend to die. The organism which can, which can have an extended shelf life or field life are the ones which produce spores. For example, bacillus species, they produce spores and the spores can be coated onto the seeds and the spores can be viable till they get the right kind of moisture for germination. So the seed uh, seed coating pellet uh, seed coating and pelleting is a, is a very very fertile area for uh, innovators and uh, you know startup companies. Now the materials used for seed coating also is very diverse. Now the material can be a polymer. It can be a natural polymer like uh, starch. It can be a natural polymer like your chitin. Chitin is a waste from the shellfish industry, from the prawn, in, prawn industry. If you can get, collect all that uh, and make chitin, chitin is a very good uh, you know, natural organic matter which can be used for coating the seeds. And uh, certain polymers are also being developed which will swell up you know, when, when it comes in contact with water and soil 
and thereby produce uh, and thereby give uh, encourage the microbial coating to break out and start colonizing the roots. Now, what is the projected growth of seed treatment biologicals in India? It is amazing. It is the CAGR, that is cumulative annual growth rate, is 10.2 percent from 2017 to an estimate of 20 uh, and in 2026. Amazing growth, 10.2. So this is a very very fertile area for agri innovators and startup companies. Try to identify natural, naturally occurring molecules, naturally occurring polymers, okay, um, which can be used for coating the seeds, and which will also provide some kind of protection to the beneficial microorganisms which are being used to coat the seeds. And uh, a lot of these big companies like Syngenta, Bayer, BASF, DuPont, Incotech, they are in the forefront of the seed treatment biologicals. They are in the Sir, you are not audible, sir. Yes, sir. Hello? Yes. OK. Now, how do I get back to the slides? Share, share screen, sir. Once again, you have to share the screen. Oh, once again, I have to share it. OK. Mm.
Uh, am I audible now? Yes, sir, you are audible. OK. Uh, Yeah, as I was talking, there's a lot of uh, space to grow for the innovators and uh, you know the startup companies in trying to identify the naturally occurring product polymers, which can be used for seed coating. I mean, this is uh, in, uh, you know seed coating industry. Okay, can you see the slide? Yes, sir. OK. OK, now uh, still a lot more work is to be done. A lot more work is to be done in, uh, you know, biofertilizers and in the, you know, microbiome space. For example, now uh, using the modern tools uh, of uh, sequencing, which has become very cheap these days, uh, the bioinformatic tools, we have to analyze various ecological niches of various crops in order to identify the microbiota which are uh, which have not been discovered so far so far, but then which are very beneficial for the plant in increasing the yield. Now I'm going to show I'm I, I'm going to highlight one particular paper which has very nicely elegantly mixed the current capabilities in sequencing and genome analysis with the identification of the species the microbial species which uh, which compose the microbiome of a particular crop now this is uh, it's a paper from uh, from from genes in 2019 where they have studied the effect of agriculture on the plant beneficial microorganisms in the soil over a number of years okay so what they did was every season they used to take a soil sample and do a metagenomic approach. That is, they used to isolate the genome, the entire DNA from that soil sample and using, uh, you know, metagenomically assembled genomes, which is a uh, software available, they could find out large number of phyla, you know, uh, occupying the soil. For example, this slide, show you the taxonomic profiling of soil microbes in the order of phyla. There are so many organisms belonging to the major phyla occupying the soil. I mean, many of them cannot be cultured in the laboratory. So as a result, we were uh, ignorant of their presence, of the benefit they provide to the growing plant. Now, using the metagenomic of, uh, effort, we are able to uh, you know, identify many, many types of microorganisms which are associated with the soil every every cropping season. So these are the major phyla which are found in a continuously cropped soil. Now, the same genomic data was further processed into genera, into the various genus of microorganisms occupying the soil and here you see so many so many genera of microorganisms in the soil which were many of them were not known to us uh, so many of them are now new discoveries now these new discoveries after proper testing can be developed into products by the startup companies the next one now, many of these microbial species of in the soil have been producing, uh, you know, enzymes, have been producing proteins which are beneficial to the plant in some way. I mean, in, in, in the entire metabolic uh, scenario. So those genomes have been clustered 
in the form of proteins, identifiable proteins produced by the various uh, you know, organisms. Many of the proteins, for example, are important in nuclear structure. Many of them are important in motility. So based on the groups of proteins produced by the entire microbiome of the soil, they were able to know which are the major activities which are ha happening in the soil. The next is all this metagenomic uh, data was assembled into agronomically important traits. For example, if you look at the first one, it is, uh, say for example, carbon fixation, nitrogen fixation, mobility of phosphorus. So many species are involved in all these activities, agronomically important activities. So now we are able to know that phosphorus mobilization is not by just one or two species of bacteria. You know, there are a host, uh, a lot of fungi, a lot of bacteria are involved in phosphorus mobilization, are involved in free nitrogen fixing. I mean, this has in, enlarged the entire horizon of microbiomes which are beneficial for plant growth. Now, I'm going to quickly go through a few examples of a started companies in the United States. They started research in the microbiomes almost 10 to 15 years ago, and now they are major players in uh, you know, microbiomes in the United States. For example, AgBiome is one particular company. They started developing solutions using the new knowledge of plant-associated microbiome to create new novel products. They have gathered about 7,000 environmental samples, created a database containing 200 million genes and 49,000 whole genome sequence. Yes, it is very, very resource intensive. A lot of money has to be sunk in to have these startups. But again, if you are focused only on nitrogen fixation or phosphorus mobilization, your, your, your cost would be uh, you know, so much less. OK, the next company is Indigo Ag. Now, Indigo Ag actually took a, a step further. You know, all the other companies have been focusing on microorganisms which are external to the plant, OK, along with the soil, but they provide benefit to the plant. Now, Indigo Ag went a step further and they analyzed and identified microorganisms which are within the plant within the vascular bundles of the plant, okay? And they provide by mobilizing nutrients, they protect the plants from insects and diseases. So they, 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 they were very, very innovative in this space. As a result, you know, Indigo Ag has now documented many, many organisms which are endophytically present in the plant. For example, their let, latest product, which was also tested in India, was using cotton plant, which contains a species, penicillium species, a fungal species, which is which occupies the vascular bundles. And this penicill penicillium species, they protect the plant from drought, from the cotton plant from drought. Uh, they were tested in India and being tested also. So, which means this, this company has gone forward in, in identifying those microorganisms which generally cannot be cultured, but using the modern tools, they have analyzed and identified these endosymbionts which provide benefit to the growing plant. And uh, so they went about collecting soils from all over the world, and they have got a huge database you know, from climate, based on climate, based on region, based on crop and this they will be tapping into all this data and so this is the process flow of from information to a product development used by indigo technologies and they say it takes about 12 to 28 months to pro to, to launch a product right from information to the genomic information to a product which can be launched in the market of course you need to have teams, you know, large teams uh, to, to work on various aspects. And see, uh, you know, man is a very, very selfish animal. He knows that microbiomes 
not only uh, responsible for the health of plants, they are also responsible for the health of animals, for insects, insect pests which attack our crops. So now the recent research is, can we uncouple this symbiosis between the microbiomes within the gut of insect pests so that the insect pest will be killed naturally? I mean, it's a very cruel thought, is it not? But yes, that's where we are going. So as a result, micro, you know, we, we, there is a lot of research on trying to kill these endosymbionts within the within the insect body, so that uh, gradually the pest will also die. So uh, yeah, this is my last slide. Uh, thank you for bearing with me. I would like to leave you with a message. See, microbes are your well wishers. Cultivate them, whether it is the soil or it is your own gut, and you will be happy. Your crop will be happy. Thank you very much. Participants, if you have any query, you can unmute yourself uh, and ask, sir. Uh, can you give one session in our STTP? Sorry, I couldn't hear the question. There's a, there's a lot of disturbance. Sir, if there are any uh, questions from the participants, we can get back to you offline also, sir. Sure, sure, we can. You can. Yes. Uh, so, uh, uh, with the kind consent of the convener, we would like to uh, close the session. Uh, we thank you, sir, for, for, your, for the valuable information on this particular topic. On behalf of the college management, principal, uh, HOD staff and students, uh, we thank you once again, sir. It's my. It's been my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you for bearing with me for that uh, el, you know, interruption which happened. Not an issue, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. You may finally exit, sir. Thank you.